Hello, and welcome to the Unsung Cyber Hero Adventures TV Network. Today's show focuses on answering the questions, how do we collectively protect our nation's critical infrastructure? Does a rising information tide actually lift all ships? Stay tuned to find out. I'm your host, Gary Berman. Our mission is to shine the light on the people and organizations who keep us safe online while at work, home, and school, and to serve as a business-to-business -business networking platform for the cybersecurity and information technology communities. We've learned that 55% of human communications is nonverbal. That's why we include the video feed, so that you have the option of seeing our guests or simply to just listen. That's also why we're called the TV Network. We're all about information sharing and business-to-business -business networking. You never know who you're going to connect with and how you'll be able to maximize opportunities resulting from hearing from our guests. This is especially valuable now that the cyber security community's primary way of conducting business conferences has been put on hold for the foreseeable future. We have an incredible guest on today's show, Scott Algier. Scott works at the intersection of cybersecurity policy and operations. He's the founder, president, and CEO of cybersecurity consulting firm Conrad Inc. Scott is the executive director of the Information Technology Information Sharing and Analysis Center, ITISAC, and the executive director of the Industry Consortium for Advancement of Security on the Internet, ICASI. As if that was not enough, he's a star's mentor to the next generation of security startup founders at Mach 37, a vertical accelerator focusing on information security product companies. Well, hey, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, my first question is just an obvious one. When do you sleep? <laughs> well, there, there is a lot going on, but I have a great team working with me as well. So uh, it, it's a very rewarding mission that we work on. You know, so speaking of missions, you know, what is the definition of, of critical infrastructure in your view? Sure. So there's the definition of critical infrastructure is essentially those elements of the economy that are so critical that it's incapacitation will have a serious impact on national security or economic security. So it's probably easier if you look at critical infrastructure, if we talk about them in buckets, right? There's banking, everyone needs money, right? Everyone needs electricity, communications, information technology, healthcare water. So these are some of the core um, elements of the critical infrastructure that we're talking about when we, when we talk about critical infrastructure security. And, you know, who is responsible for those designations? You know, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, CISA and, and their role in, in critical infrastructure. Sure. There actually is a legal definition in, in statute about what critical infrastructure is. But then the Department of Homeland Security also works um, to um, with each of the critical infrastructure sectors and in the National Infrastructure Protection Plan last updated, I believe it was 2013, there, there's a list of critical infrastructure sectors in there and it details how which of these critical infrastructure CISA works with and then which uh, the critical infrastructures other elements of the government work with. So, for example, there's a sector specific agency within the government that works with each critical infrastructure sector. So the uh, IT industry works directly with CISA, but um, financial services, their sector specific agency is the Department of Treasury. So we try to align uh, the expertise for the government with the expertise within industry. You know, and, and there have been a number of different organizational uh, attempts and changes, you know, through the through the federal government uh, to just try to coalesce everyone's energy, you know, around cybersecurity priorities. Uh, what's your view of, of how CISA is assuming leadership in that role? Yeah, well, I think CISA has really done a great job, especially over the last couple of years in uh, consolidating leadership around cybersecurity putting some thought leadership into how we think about doing our uh, risk management of, of the critical infrastructure sectors. One of the challenges has been in the past has been uh, there were each of these uh, critical infrastructure sectors uh, that had matched to the sector specific agencies, but a lot of that work was never really integrated. And I think what we've seen over the last uh, two or three years is CISA has done a lot better job of uh, integrating some of the expertise 
from across the government and across industry. Uh, and you know, I think we're really seeing that play out in the work that they're doing on the national critical functions. And so you mentioned, you know, various industries and, and sectors of the economy. Which sectors of the economy um, do you think, not just of the economy, but, but of America's critical infrastructure, you know, do you think are the most vulnerable right about now? Yeah, so I, I don't know if most vulnerable is really the right measure. I think um, every sector has its own vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, everyone's working hard to mitigate those vulnerabilities. There are ways to group the sectors of kind of importance, if you will, um, lifeline sectors, right? So those um, sectors that life, you know, that human life depend on, right? You can't live without electricity, right? So you can't live without a function in the healthcare and the industry. There's also millisector um, sectors, right? Which those are uh, operate at the speed of, of, of the internet, right? Um, communications and IT that really propel the information infrastructure. So there are a couple of ways that you can bucket. Of course, you, nobody can survive without food, right? Nobody can survive without water. So those would be other examples of the lifeline sectors. Um, so it's really identifying which of the, of the in, uh, critical infrastructure sectors may not necessarily be the right way to look at it anymore. I think what we've come to learn is that there's looking at functions that propel the economy or functions that propel life and safety. And it, it, it's much better to look at those critical functions that underpin the economy than it is to look at critical infrastructure sectors on their own. So for example, if you're trying to look at um, the, a, a function of um, Food safety or, or food secure uh, food, right? There's uh, this the making sure people have, making sure people can eat. There's a whole process in place from getting the food from the farm to the table that you need to do a risk assessment there to to see where you're most vulnerable, to see where you the most likely is to have a significant impact, and then look at how you can build resilience so that you can continue to, delivering food. And I think we've seen some of this play out a little bit in a pandemic where we've had um, the food supply has been able to be delivered. We've had not, we've had a lot of, a lot more consumption of uh, at the grocery store where people are buying a lot more at the grocery store. And then even in some of the uh, food and agriculture plants that have been impacted by the COVID-19, um, there's still food being delivered, right? There's, there's still food being produced and making it to the table. Um, so I think this, concept of critical functions that have that we've um, worked worked on in the IT sector in 2009 uh, looked at this uh, looked at what we call critical uh, functions within the IT space um, now there's called national level functions within DHS They're looking at this concept of critical functions is a much better way to look at um, the the integration of the each, of each of the critical infrastructures and how we the integration of, of them creates one economy and creates one um, creates a holistic way of looking at looking at threats as opposed to is the IT sector more vulnerable than the communications or electricity more vulnerable than the healthcare in a way um, it doesn't matter which sector is more, more vulnerable what matters is the functions that are important to the consumer and to national defense and that propelled the economy. Well, you know, one of the interesting things uh, that I've learned um, is that, uh, you know, the bad guys, the black hats, as it were, uh, you know, share information, you know, readily and easily. Uh, they even have the equivalent of uh, some kind of Yelp rating system for the delivery of, you know, uh, hacking services and things like that. What is uh, the role of um, the information ISACs, you know, and, and if you can comment uh, kind of on two levels, the first one is uh, in your role as executive director of the IT ISAC, but then also um, you're involved with the umbrella uh, organization that cuts across uh, all the different ISACs, right? Yes. So I think information sharing is not the solution, is not the silver bullet, but it's an important part of a comprehensive risk management program for companies. No company today can look 
can see all the risks. The, the risk is too big. The number of incidents are, are too large. The number of uh, indicators companies are receiving today is, is too large for m most companies to consume. Nobody has enough analysts to look at all of the indicators to do the analysis that's necessary. So in the same way, the, the, uh, the attackers are learning from each other and sharing with information with each other to improve their abilities to, to attack, the network defenders uh, have forums where they can share information, not just raw indicators about what they're seeing on their networks, but analysis about what, it, what, what they think it means, uh, effective practices that they've come across on how to stop it. Um, what we've, we also see what's happening is companies identify vulnerabilities um, that, are, that are impactful to them, that are important to them, and they're letting other people know, hey, we're, we, we didn't patch, and this is why we think it's important for you to patch, right? So there's a lot of value in, in this type of information sharing because it helps network defenders prioritize uh, their, uh, what's important. There's so much information out there now. Um, having this ability to collaborate with peer analysts helps you establish the importance. It also helps you learn. It also helps consolidate uh, resources. Nobody has enough analysts to look at every threat that they have. But hey, wouldn't it be great if you took someone takes this these two sets of threats someone else takes the next three sets of threats and then we compare notes on them on a regular basis so now instead of having you know six companies look at the same three threats we're having three companies look at you know one three threats and we're like having another three companies looking at another th set of threats so we're able to cross pollinate that information sharing and that knowledge in the same way through the national council of isacs it, the National Council of ISACs brings together the information sharing communities, uh, the, the operation analysts from each of the sector specific information sharing and analysis organizations. And our operations team shares information with each other. So we're, this is something that the financial services sector is seeing. It's of importance. So they'll share that out with, with the other members of the National Council of ISACs. Another ISAC might uh, have a member who is dealing with an issue and they need assistance with. And so they'll send a um, request for information out to the National Council of ISACs. We'll look at it. If we can help, great, we'll provide that back. If not, we'll ping our, ping our members and say, hey, we have a peer, a peer company and a partner ISAC who's, who's asking for this information. Can anyone help out? And members happily share information that they have, whether it's raw indicators or whether it's analysis or whether it's just best practices on how to defend. And so how many uh, members um, are in the entire uh, ISAC you know, ecosystem? How many member companies or individuals? You know, how would you dimensionalize that for our audience? Yes, so it's thousands, if not tens of thousands of companies that are in this ecosystem that we've built uh, through, through the National Council of ISAC. So, Every ISAC has its own, uh, every ISAC is independent, has its own leadership structure and membership base, has its own funding model. Um, and then um, this network is also a global network, right? So some ISACs are focused just in the United States or perhaps North America. And then you have others that are uh, global sectors who have members across across the globe. So it's really a, a a global reach of tens of, uh, of thousands of companies, of not, of not you know, 10,000 companies or more, which you add in all of the member companies of all of the individual ISACs. And uh, for our audience, we'll make sure to have uh, more information on how you can become a member of a particular ISAC um, in our uh, show notes. Um, so let's um, spend a little bit of time, Scott, uh, diving a little deeper into the healthcare uh, ISAC. You know, given COVID and, um, you know, we'd be remiss in not addressing how uh, the ISACs are working together to protect critical infrastructure during this unusual time. Sure. So the healthcare ISAC is a great organization and it's run uh, by Denise Anderson, who's been uh, doing uh, a lot of great work in the information sharing space. Uh, she also happens to chair the National Council of ISACs 
And I would recommend to you and your audience that perhaps she would be a really uh, great speaker to speak about what's going on in the healthcare industry. They have a lot of unique concerns, the health, a lot of smart devices uh, that are in the healthcare network so that the, um, patients can be monitored by doctors remotely. So they have a really a lot of unique security concerns around the devices themselves, as well as ensuring that they protect the patient information on there that's stored on hospital networks and infrastructure. And you get all the way down to the individual doctor's offices, right? Your, your primary care doctor who who stores your 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 healthcare information on his his system, his or her system. So those are a whole bunch of unique challenges within that space. But it's really uh, the healthcare ISAC and Denise's leadership has really sprung up. Uh, they've done a lot of great work, and they've really sprung up a, a really strong capability in a pretty short amount of time. You know, you're saying something really really interesting using the word spun up. You know. What about um, you know agility? I mean, everybody in the cybersecurity and IT ecosystem has had to become instantly more agile than they were, whatever benchmark they would use. What's your view and advice to our audience um, about taking the newfound agility? Uh, for example, I, we uh, did a, a great interview with Kevin Tierney, the VP of Global Cybersecurity for General Motors, in part about uh, their pivot to creating ventilators. You know, in a span of only you know about three weeks. Um, you know, how how does the cybersecurity and IT ecosystem maintain that agility once we, we get through all this? Yeah, well, I think what, one of the things that we we've learned is the, the advantage of a distributed network. Um, the the uh, core internet infrastructure itself has been able to withstand this work from home environment. We. I think a lot of business continuity plans have really been stressed um, to ensure that there's able to con con ensure continuity. I think on the technology side, we've seen a lot of challenges around ensuring access to sensitive information, remote access to sensitive information, uh, VPNs access and um, making sure that those, you don't overload your VPN systems. So we've had uh, a lot of companies look at um, you know, pretty much on the fly adjust how they securely connect into the into the corporate into the corporate network. Um, so that's been a huge challenge. We've also seen challenges on um, the human resources side, right? How do you onboard and offboard uh, employees for getting secure machines to new individuals uh, who you're onboarding? And how do you get strip credentials away from those who are who are no longer working for you. A lot of companies have these policies in place uh, for the remote workforce, but the remote workforce was a really small percentage of the actual workforce at the time. And now since 90%, 80%, whatever the percentage of, of workers are now uh, in some of these companies are now working remotely, uh, those policies have really been stressed. But I think uh, you know, the, the, the technology has withheld, um, has withstood the, the, the stress of it um, and I don't know, it's been, um, it's been challenging for sure. And if people on the network security side, they've had to re rethink very quickly on the fly about how to make their enterprise secure when you're now all of a sudden, you don't have control over, over, over wh wh where your network is, right? And not everybody can just, you know, not everybody's on the corporate network all the time anymore. So it has been a real challenge for it. And we're actually, the ITI sec is we'll be releasing a, a white paper in the next couple of days or so to talk about some of the impacts that we've seen uh, on the in the security space on COVID-19. Well, we'd love to have, you know, a copy of the or a link to the white paper if you think, um, you know, that uh, is possible. Is that something you can do? Yeah, we'll certainly do that. I'll get that off to you and you can share it with your viewers. Great. Thanks a lot. And. You know, as we're winding down here, um, we're going to be doing an episode entitled uh, Cybersecurity is National Security. What is your view of, of uh, nation states and, and, and the role of, of ISACs in protecting critical infrastructure? Uh, that We could speak for hours about that, I'm sure. But, you know, what's your kind of top line about the role of nation states, you know, attacking our country? Yeah, so um, obviously, 
it's bad. <laughs> um, we, the, the, one of the real unique challenges in cyberspace is the industry, private industry is not being asked to defend themselves against nations, rough run the nation, nation state adversaries, um, which is kind of a unique position for industry to be in. So, which is part of the, the value of the ISAC community is it gives you a scaling capability to bring in more resources um, that you can't ordinarily get a front on your, on your own. And we talked a little bit about it as well. And the, the nations, the, the attackers are getting better and a lot of them are leveraging nation state tools, right? So a nation state builds a tool and then it's discovered, people announce it and now the bad guys know about it as well, right? So they are able to take those tools and use them for in their own criminal purposes or to go after, uh, to go after companies. So we're really seeing a, an elevate, the nation state actors are elevating the game for everybody because those tools get leaked, those tools have become available and then they're out there for regular cons uh, consumption of, among the regular criminal community. So the really a way for companies to defend against this is to partner with their peer organizations so that they can um, learn from each other, they have a scaling capability, um, the, there's we aggregate the cost of defense, if you will, over multiple companies so that we can do more together than we might be able to do individually. Well, that's terrific, Scott. Um, so my last question is, you know, is there anything else that, you know, you'd like to add to amplify your mission? Well, just uh, thank you for the opportunity. I, I think it's, it's one of the real challenges that we've had in since COVID-19, which I didn't touch on in my previous remarks, was security budgets being slashed, right? There's a lot of pressure on companies um, to cut costs or economic uncertainty. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of companies are have to reevaluate what their, what their security spend is. And I think participating in information sharing forums is a really cost-effective way to increase the company's uh, cybersecurity posture for all the all of the reasons that we've spoken about. So as, P, as um, leaders are grappling with uh, budget decisions and where to make spends, uh, I think they I would encourage them to look at information sharing communities, sector industry specific ISACs as a really effective, cost effective way to to um, increase your cybersecurity capabilities. Well, Scott, we can go on for, for hours and hours, but, you know, thanks so much to, uh, to you for this incredible uh, interview. To learn more, we'll have Scott's contact information and other links in the show notes, as I mentioned earlier. If you would like to be a guest on our show, please just send an email to Gary at CyberHeroesComics.com with an S. Thanks, everybody. We hope this helps. <laughs>